Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here. This is the second time I've had the privilege of speaking to this group about some of the work we're doing down in Miami. And um, as already stated, there are actually really exciting times in spinal cord research. You've heard already this morning about some of the, the science translational studies that are going on, as well as the clinical studies. So today I've got the opportunity to talk about some of the studies we're doing in Miami. And I'll pick two areas, and the areas are protection uh, and repair. Uh, this is uh, downtown Miami. Uh, Lois Pope Life Center is in the middle of that very large uh, medical uh, complex. We have a VA hospital, a private hospital, we have Ryder Trauma Center, Jackson Memorial Hospital. So it's one of the busiest centers in the country. Uh, this is uh, Biscayne Bay, and that's where Shake a Leg, one of our uh, outstanding uh, sailing programs where people with disabilities can get into water and go scuba diving, sailing, and things like that. So if you're in Miami, please look us up. This is my disclosure conflict of interest. It has nothing to do with what I'm speaking about today. So what I would like to talk to you about is some of the experimental work we've been doing on therapeutic hypothermia. We think this has promise for the uh, acute subacute spinal cord injury condition. We'll talk about how these studies have now been moved to the people. Then we'll talk about the Schwann cell transplantation. Um, we've been working on this for many, many years. And as already stated, we've submitted our IND to the FDA to commission to do first in man a human autologous Schwann cell transplantation. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the combination approaches that uh, you want to hear about, uh, what we do in addition to uh, cell therapies. So this is the Miami Project. It's a center of excellence. Just think of it as a really big department. Uh, right now, we have about 30 laboratories. These are MDs, PhDs, MD, PhDs. So we have the ability to walk down the hall and talk to a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, a rehabilitation medicine person, PT, uh, bioengineers, everything you would need to really uh, attack this very complicated problem of spinal cord injury. And yes, we have a long uh, list of um, uh, collaborators throughout the world, um, and also more and more biotech. And I just want to mention and thank Geron, uh, Neurostem, and Individual Therapeutics for reaching out and building alliances with the Mounting Project. And I think in the next several years, you'll see some very exciting things uh, due to those alliances. So this is the Miami Project. It's a holistic approach to CNS injury and repair, a neuroprotection pathophysiology. What can we give in the early injury setting to limit secondary injury mechanisms? Right now, we have very little in terms of pharmacotherapy, if you will. Transplantation, gene regeneration. Can we repair the nervous system? And this is one of the most exciting areas of neuroscience. Rehabilitation, even today, can we retrain the injured brain and spinal cord to promote plasticity and recovery of function? Quality of life, yes, it's important to get people out of chairs, but how about neuropathic pain, bowel and bladder disorders, a fertility, all the things that people are coming to us and saying, we can work on this. And do we have the potential to translate these uh, findings that we obtain in rats and mice, for example, to people? Can we improve functional outcome? And finally, can we train the next generation of scientists and clinicians to actually carry out these very complicated problems? So that's what we're doing in Miami. And we've been doing it for 26 years, a long time now. So bench to bedside, bedside to bench research programs. This is the classic example. Yes, the basic scientist talks to the clinicians, but then he and she then comes back and talks to the basic scientists and tries to figure out how we can do this better. So in the project, we have some outstanding uh, molecular biologists uh, trying to do the discovery research. We know a lot, but we don't even know everything. We think we have some of the best um, uh, animal models of spinal cord injury, both small and large animals, in which we can test new compounds and strategies. Clinical investigations. Currently, in, in my project, we have about 25 clinical studies ongoing. But of course, ultimately, we have to take it to the next level and do clinical trials, multi-center uh, trials, which is really um, the, the gold standard for deciding whether a new therapy uh, works or not. So that's what we're trying to do. And this is just the multidisciplinary holistic approach to spinal cord injury. Many years ago, I started building this puzzle because I knew it was going to be very complicated. I mean, obviously, you're going to try to save neurons. You're going to try to regenerate. Uh, uh, axons, then we started talking about why axons do not regenerate, these inhibitory factors, and the lack of growth factors, this in extrinsic and intrinsic limitations of axonal regeneration that we're studying today. 
And then transplantation. Okay, if we're going to put a cell in the spinal cord, what is going to be that cell? What is the best cell? And is it going to be safe? And then remyelination. You've heard today from uh, Geron talking about uh, targeting remyelination. Is this a way to actually improve um, uh, functional recovery? So at the same time, uh, in people living with paralysis, what type of conditioning, rehabilitation strategies can we do to maximize uh, function, to delay uh, aging processes that are happening in you and I today to actually enhance uh, recovery and long-term outcome? So what about this uh, very complicated problem of spinal cord injury? I think you all know that each year we have 11 to 12,000 new spinal cord injuries in the United States. It's a world problem. We just got back from, from uh, Tokyo, which is before that, uh, Saudi Arabia, and then South America, where numbers of spinal cord injury patients is on the rise due to development, developmental um, uh, programs in terms of more buildings and really poor uh, uh, drivers of cars and lack of helmets. So it's a major, major problem throughout the world. And of course, currently we believe there's about 5.3 million people living with paralysis due to some type of, of uh, CNS injury. So it's, it's, it's a big, a big problem. I think you've also, over the uh, years, heard people like myself speak about some exciting therapies. And, uh, and sometimes you just wonder where these exciting therapies actually ended up. But these are a list of therapies that I like, a short list of therapies that I think are very, very interesting and certainly on the horizon. And we and others uh, in the room are currently working, working on these therapies. Uh, the problem with, um, let's turn our attention to, if you wanted to protect the spinal cord during the first several hours after injury, what type of drug or strategy would you use? And as a basic scientist, my job sometimes appears to be to complicate the literature. And there are so many cell death mechanisms now that out there now, it gets a little bit problematic in terms of what type of drug would you actually use to stop the process. Uh, back in the 80s, um, John McDonald and colleagues, for example, were looking at cytotoxicity. And then we started finding out that cells die by different cellular mechanisms, apoptosis, um, and other types of um, uh, actually uh, injury, energy dependent mechanism of cell death. That was encouraging because maybe that gave us some new targets for new pharmacological development. And then subsequently we started emphasizing the importance of inflammation and um, edema formation, things of this nature in terms of cell death mechanisms. So how would you attack this very complicated problem of targeting these multi-injury pathways when you know that maybe one drug is not going to work? We decided that maybe mild cooling might be a way to go about doing this. In 1986, I wrote the first paper showing that if you reduce the temperature of the brain of a rat two degrees uh, during a cardiac arrest, you could actually improve uh, outcome dramatically. And those types of studies have now been successfully translated where people that have a cardiac arrest are rushed to the hospital and they're cool. Term babies now, if they have some type of problem during delivery, they're cool. We're now cooling people with severe uh, and moderate traumatic brain injury and they're benefiting. So there seems to be a translation, okay, of, of things that we found out in rats to people. Um, how about spinal cord injury? Can you think about someone coming to the emergency room, lowering their temperature two to three degrees, would that make a difference in long-term outcome? This is that first study they were published in 2000. You take a rat, you traumatize the thoracic spinal cord, uh, moderate to severe, you wait an hour, and then you bring the core temperature down to 33 degrees. Okay, normal temperature is 33. And you maintain that core temperature for about four hours and follow that up with a, a slow rewarming phase. This is, you've heard BBB before, this is that 21 point scale where we look at walking and you say, and you see them very easily compared to, to rats that were normal thermic after the spinal cord injury. These rats are walking much, much better. And this is a pretty dramatic effect. So in a thoracic spinal cord injury, a mild cooling after a spinal cord injury seems to work. Well, how about cervical spinal cord injury? My neurosurgeon friends came down and said, Dalton, thoracic is, is important, but you know, a lot of people are having cervical spinal cord injury. So we developed a, a cervical spinal cord injury with Damien Pierce, and uh, sure enough, we uh, tra 
traumatize the cervical spinal cord, we wait an hour, we bring cord temperature down to 33 degrees, and we see some very dramatic effects in terms of uh, saving the tissue, in terms of tissue preservation. This is your uh, hypothermic animal. This is your normal thermic animal. So now we're seeing that in a second model of severe spinal cord injury, hypothermia seems to work. It also preserved these motor neurons, you see, that actually innervate the muscles of the, of the arm. So you're getting increased uh, uh, upper extremity function in addition to walking. Many people, many laboratories throughout the world have, um, have replicated this work. Uh, it's really important that people try to replicate other people's findings before we try to move this into, into people. Because sometimes we've had some, some missed opportunities where actually we thought something was really real, but then other scientists tried to replicate the results and it just was not replicable. So it's good to know that hypothermia seems to work in many hands. So we next decided, well, if it looks like it's safe and it looks like it's more effective than any drug we've got, Let's try to translate this into people. The problem we found very quickly is that there are no clinical guidelines or protocols to use mild hypothermia in a, uh, in a uh, uh, clinical study. It's considered an experimental procedure, but unfortunately, we started using it on uh, selective uh, individuals, and because of the media attention, people started thinking it was standard practice. So this is um, Kevin Everett, uh, he played for the Buffalo Bills, and uh, one Sunday afternoon in 2007, he had a, a severe spinal cord injury. This is Andy Cappuccino, uh, Andy is a young uh, orthopedic surgeon who's the, uh, the, the, uh, the clinical uh, doctor for the uh, Buffalo Bills, and six months before that, uh, this day, he had actually heard me talk about uh, therapeutic hypothermia at the Cervical Spine uh, Society meeting, and I talked about that we had cooled a couple of people and it seemed to be working. So since then, he'd been carrying cold saline around his emergency vehicle, and actually Kevin got an IV infusion of cold saline about 15 minutes after injury. That was followed up by uh, a lot of phone calls and then 48-hour cooling and slow rewarming. And, um, you know, I didn't hear too much after that, you know, how's Kevin doing? Oh, he's, he's in rehab, he's doing well, and didn't really know what that meant. And then one day, National, um, Sports Illustrated called me and said, you know, we're doing a study on, on Kevin Everett. Uh, can you give me some comments? I said, sure. And then this came out. So Kevin's doing really well. This is just an example that you can cool someone early after spinal cord injury. And in this case, um, maybe there's a benefit. Uh, but of course, this is one case. It really does not mean anything. Uh, Kevin got the best uh, neurosurgical um, uh, uh, treatment early on, decompression. Also got... Uh, Melaprenicillone early, so my friend Ed Hall called me up and said, you know, the reason Evan, uh, Kevin Everett's walking today is he's got methylprenicillone early, so, you know, really don't know. So ultimately, what you have to do when you really want to move something to the clinic is to do a multi-center trial. A controlled clinical trial will half the patients uh, get the therapy, the other half the patients do not. So we decided to, to move this at, at, at the University of Miami into an IV approved trial. So for the last several years, we've been cooling uh, Asia A, worst case scenario, high cervical spinal cord injuries at the Ryder Trauma Center. We've been using modest hypothermia, 33 degrees, just like we did in the rat. And our plan was to uh, try to get the uh, temperature down within six hours after injury. So the individual had to come into the emergency room, had to be stabilized, had to do the MRI imaging, everything that we do and then uh, target temperature reached within six hours. This is the acute spinal cord injury hypothermia inclusion exclusion criteria. This is the first study that we published in 2009. This was our first 14 patients. And the take home message, just like a safety trial, is can you do this? And do you have any risk factors associated with this therapy? The good news, there is no uh, significant increase in risk factors. We saw no evidence of cardiac arrhythmias. As you reduce the person's temperature, if it goes below 33 degrees, you can actually uh, have a high incidence of cardiac arrhythmias, you can have a deep vein thrombosis, you can have increased pneumonias. In this case, um, Alan Levy's the uh, uh, first author. Alan's a brilliant neurosurgeon and uh, found no increase in risk factors. So it appears to be relatively safe. Technology has finally caught up with us. What we're using, and other uh, centers are also using, are these endovascular catheters. 
You just put them in this femoral vein, run it up the inferior vena cava. It's the catheter that cools the blood as it passes the catheter. So the nurse or, or doctor can just tighten in the temperature you want the patient to be, and that patient is very stable and at that temperature for as long as you want. So this is just your cooling profile of hypothermia. We can bring temperature down relatively quick at, quickly. Most importantly, we can maintain that 33 degree uh, target for many uh, uh, hours. In this case, we're doing 48 hours. And then most importantly, when it's time to rewarm, re you have to do it at a very slow rate. Again, these endovascular catheters allow us to do this. So I, I said that first we're um, attempting to make a difference in people's lives that have the worst case scenario, high cervical Asia A's. We actually wake them up uh, at, uh, at 12 hours and then do a second neurological exam to make sure that they are worst case scenario, Asia A. And this is the data that's very encouraging. It was published uh, now in 2010 uh, in, in neurosurgery showing that at one year there appears to be about a 43% conversion of Asia A to B's and C's. So it's very encouraging that you can have a therapy that you can uh, deliver early after spinal cord injury and have a, a chance to actually convert the complete to incomplete. So, so we're very optimistic, uh, many people are, about using their uh, mild cooling to target acute spinal cord injury. So we've set out to try to uh, do a 17 center a multi-center trial, Arctic Acute Rapid Cooling Trial for Injuries of Spinal Cord, where we'll cool approximately 250 people. Half of those people will be normal thermic, will prevent fevers, which we also know are uh, devastating in terms of spinal cord injury, but the other half will be cooled within six hours. The price tag for this is between 10 and 12 million dollars, and it will take about five years to complete it. We wrote the grant, we submitted it uh, last year, year before last. It got uh, a really good response from NIH, but we got no money. So we're revising that, uh, that uh, grant as we speak, and we'll submit it later this year or early next year. And hopefully we'll be able to do this clinical trial that could change medicine in terms of using mild cooling in the acute injury setting. Uh, we've also got a, a journal uh, for temperature, uh, therapeutic hypothermia and temperature management. It's becoming a major, major uh, uh, factor in terms of treating uh, patients with a number of uh, neurological disorders. So with that, I would like to turn uh, to our repair studies that we're doing in the Miami Project. Again, uh, one of the most important areas in neuroscience now is not only to save neurons from dying, but to replace those neurons and promote regeneration, um, trying to produce circuits that are functional and will result in improved quality of life and function in people with acute and chronic spinal cord injury. And today we're not going to have time to go over the, the hurdles that it takes to actually have this happen, but one, um, you have the inhibitory molecules, you have the inability to maybe know exactly where that uh, axon has to grow to have its target, and then will it make a functional uh, synapse. A lot, of, a lot of things that we're having to think about uh, in the preclinical work. We have chosen to use helper cells, cell therapies that may change the environment to make it more permissive for regeneration. So you've already heard about uh, human embryonic stem cells potentially to actually uh, induced remyelination and return of functions. Uh, we ourselves have chosen to uh, use the subject's own cells. They're Schwann cells. These are the uh, myelinating cells of the peripheral nervous system. Uh, Dr. Richard Bungie and Mary Bungie came from Warshu in the 80s with the vision to use Schwann cells to change the environment to make it permissive for re regeneration. But at the same time, we have all these other cells in which to think about. And all these cells have very uh, solid preclinical data to support that these cells may be good for regeneration and repair. So it's really a really tough, tough call in terms of what cell you're actually going to move forward. You only have so many scientists, you only have so much time, you only have so much uh, money, you only have so much lab space to actually you know, concentrate on your cells. So in, in 2008, we decided, and this is just the Mind Project faculty getting together in 2008, arguing over what cell to use, and we decided to use a Schwann cell. Now, why did we pick the Schwann cell? 
Well, we decided maybe we, would not, we, might, we could replace a myelinating cell with a Schwann cell, the oligodendrocyte that we now know dies after spinal cord injury. The Schwann cell releases growth factors. We've heard about growth factors already this morning. So it can actually enhance axonal regeneration and regrowth and plasticity. But also the Schwann cell could actually remyelinate, demyelinated fibers. Okay, so basically you've heard this before from, um, from uh, Dr. Uh, Gold when he talked about the, the rationale for using uh, human embryonic stem cells to target remyelination. This is an old slide now. We heard now that it's four patients that have been treated. So this is a very, very exciting, positive step in the field, that cells can be placed uh, into people. Again, the difference is we're using the patient's own uh, cell, not because the bird is a beautiful bird, but because it promotes regeneration. It leads to release of growth factors. It remyelinates CNS uh, axons. It can be transplanted autologously. You do not have to even start to think about immunosuppression. We can take a peripheral nerve from you and I today, serial nerve, and in three weeks generate a million of your own Schwann cells and inject them back into the injured spinal cord. Many of you may get the Project Magazine. This is that product. These are human Schwann cells that have been processed in GMP facilities and are ready to be injected into people. We have a lot of preclinical data. This is one of the Bun Mary Bunny's early slides showing that you can take the Schwann cell, put it in a gap in the spinal cord, and enhance uh, growth across the gap in the spinal cord using a bridging, bridging strategy, as you can see right here, or a combination approach. Uh, we had a question earlier today, what are going to be the combination approaches that we're thinking about? The one that we're excited about right now is Schwann cells as a major brick and wall, and then on top of that, uh, roll around a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that jacks up levels of cyclic AMP and enhan enhances cell survival and axon regeneration. And this triple combination, injection of uh, uh, cyclic AMP itself. Under these conditions, uh, Damien Pierce and Mary Bungie uh, showed that we got like a world's record in terms of axonal growth into the uh, 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 bridge of the spinal cord but out the other side. And the rats a walk beautifully. So there's a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm in the field that a cell therapy plus other things may be the answer in terms of promoting successful regeneration and repair. Another thing that we're not going to talk about today, but something you should keep in mind as you hear future uh, presentations, is you can make these cells super cells now. You can take the cells through viral vector uh, strategies. You can make these cells synthesize and release almost anything you want. You can release a protein, a growth factor, an enzyme to, uh, to target the proteoglycans and decrease uh, uh, some of the inhibitory molecules. You can actually transduce a cell with a mul synthetic multineurotrophin that was developed at NIH. And this particular molecule allows the cells then to activate all the cell signaling cascades in terms of the neurotrophins, in this case, PDNF, NC3, and NGF. So you don't have to infuse all these, these proteins that are very expensive and most of the time don't even get to the target. You can actually transduce the cell to become a, a carrier of those proteins. This is some of Mary Bunge's data showing that when the Schwann cells are transduced with the multicenter multi protein, there's a lot better survival. And you can see that very dramatically in this immunofluorescent. And also, you get much more robust axonal regeneration. So I think actually that's going to be the future. We're going to try our best to see what these simple cells do, but I think we're actually going to try to make them super cells to even do more as we find out exactly what's needed to repair the nervous system. Okay, so how do we move from the rats to man? So this is just a nice comparison uh, showing a rat spinal cord with a human spinal cord. And we felt strongly that we needed to do some studies in larger animals, especially if you're injecting cells, uh, to make sure that it, it, this procedure was safe. So how do you mimic this human, human disorder? Uh, we've chosen, uh, most recently, the mini pig. They have a very nice spinal cord injury, uh, a nice spinal cord, good size compared to the rat. And we can actually do a lot of imaging, so we're doing a lot of um, MRI imaging, just like we do in a person. We're doing a lot of electrophysiology, just like we're doing in a person. And we can also uh, visualize very nicely the injection 
of the cells into the spinal cord. So this is actually using the Geron injector in this particular picture where uh, Dr. Guest and colleagues is showing that with uh, ultrasound you can actually verify exactly where the contusion is and you can watch the cells go into the spinal cord. This is exactly what we'll be doing in a person. Uh, this is transplantation of Schwann cells uh, and showing myelination in pigs. Uh, we're, we're doing our best to uh, try to mimic what we're going to see in people, and here we see a, a axon regeneration, and most importantly, myelination of those autologous Schwann cells. Um, I'm not going to show a lot of uh, other studies here uh, because of time. Occasionally we do do non-human primate studies, not a lot, but again, in this particular study by a guest and colleagues, we're trying to look at fine um, uh, finger function in the primate, the corpal spinal tract. I mean, it's extremely important in man. And this study is very exciting. That shows that you can enter the uh, cervical uh, spinal cord, the corpal spinal tract, and you see for months at a time severe paralysis in terms of walking and hand function. And, and then with a delayed transplantation of autologous human Schwann cells, you see improvement uh, in function. So with these data in mind, we're going to a uh, phase one safety trial. You've already heard what a phase one safety trial is. It's a dose escalation trial. We'll be using Asia outcome measures, if you will. Uh, this is our autologous human Schwann cell a clinical trial investigative group. It's a big group of people. It takes so much expertise we're not a private company, we're an academic institution, so it took a long time to build the expertise, but um, we started the project in 2008. We did our pre pre ind uh, consultation with the FDA, our pre ind and IND submission uh, about three weeks ago, and uh, we just received some questions from the FDA. This is, the, this is our IND submission. This is Kim Anderson, and Anil Awana, and Mary Bungie, uh, we're just very proud that we finally got the document. We're sending it out in the mail. Uh, they've come back with a couple of uh, questions. Um, I'm hearing that maybe I'll get as many as uh, 49 questions next week, but we'll, we'll see what happens. They have 30 days to respond. But so far, I mean, we've had a very nice dialogue with the FDA. They are the patient's own cells. They're autologous cells. And I think we've checked off all the major boxes. So hopefully we're going to move this forward. At the same time, these are the future IND submissions that we're thinking about. The human Schwann cell targeting chronic spinal cord injury for the reasons I hope you now understand. We have some very good safety and uh, clinical data showing that you can delay the transplantation of these cells and make a difference. Neuroprotection, I've talked about hypothermia, but there are other drugs out there. And ultimately, a combination approaches with Schwann cells plus Rolofram, a Schwann cells with five, FO5, just keep that in mind for a second. And then uh, the cl collaboration with in vivo therapeutics and others looking at novel scaffolding materials with the Schwann cells. I think it's going to be really exciting. We're really proud of this. NIH finally got the bright idea to put money into a translational program where someone discovers a small peptide, for example, FO5, that makes axons grow better than anything we have, and help that investigator who knows nothing about chemistry, I mean, chemistry manipulating the peptide to make it actually something that you can put in the person. So this is the new uh, Blueprint Neurotherapeutics Network, and the two of our scientists in the mind project got, I think, the first six, six grants. But anyway, this is just what's happening out there in terms of the spinal cord field. And uh, as you see, we are very excited about some of the uh, protection and repair studies that we're doing. I'm not going to leave you without talking about some of the rehabilitation research. This is just some of the things that we've been doing for many years. Uh, male fertility, strength and fatigue, uh, evaluation of assistive devices before they get to people, spinal cord conduction, pain, spasticity, bowel bladder, uh, pharma uh, pharmacological um, uh, tr treatments to target lipids. And these are just the clinical trials. You can go on our webpage and these are some of the clinical studies that we have going on these different aspects. So we're trying to make a, a difference in people's lives today, uh, but at the same time, we think that in the near future, you're gonna be able to see some very exciting things that are gonna make a big, big difference, hopefully, as we move this field forward. Take home message, it's gonna be a combination approach, uh, a, a neuroprotective agent, a bridging strategy, cellular transplants, improving axonal function, and then a lot of rehabilitation. This is a very talented group of scientists, clinicians. I just uh, tell you that we're supported by NIH, the Department of Defense, 
state of Florida, my project, and the Bonacani Fund. Mark Bonacani, many years ago, had a high cervical spinal cord injury. The Bonacani Fund stepped up and said, you know, we're going to help you move this field forward. Uh, we also train, train the next generation of scientists, and these are some of the people that we trained are now all over the world uh, making a difference, hopefully, in people's lives. If you're ever in Miami, this is the Lois Pope Life Center. This is the home of the Miami Project. Please look us up. Thank you very much. Visit u2fp.org for more coverage from Working to Walk and the latest in spinal cord injury news.